Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Welcome if you're new and I hope you're having a wonderful day. So my name is Ksenia International. For those of you who don't know, I create content for people who are going through the family immigration process by themselves. So I'm not an attorney. I'm not a legal representative in any way. My videos are based on publicly available information. Uh, when I was applying for immigration, I did everything completely on my own without help of any lawyer. Lawyers. So that is why I created my channel. I wanted to give you guys a resource of everything that you possibly need to know for the family immigration process and have the confidence to do it on your own. I definitely suggest that you browse through my channel and check out all of the videos that I have. So today's video is going to be an update on a video that I filmed in the very beginning when I first started my YouTube channel and that is a video on the cover letter. Some things have changed since then, so I wanted to provide you guys with a more updated, a more clear cover letter video. What is a cover letter? Basically, a cover letter is a comprehensive list of all the documents and all the supporting evidence that you are including in your application packet. If you have already started working on the immigration forms, you know that there is a lot of people paperwork that is involved and it's very easy to get overwhelmed. In terms of the cover letter, I would like to think of it as serving two purposes. The first one is obviously for USCIS to see when they open your packet for them to be able to see what is exactly in this file. In addition to that, the cover letter serves a second purpose, which is for you to stay organized in putting together your immigration packet. A cover letter is by no means a requirement. So when you are submitting USCIS applications, documents, whatever it may be, it doesn't say that a cover letter is an absolute requirement, although it is a really good idea. Another question that I frequently get is, should I be including a separate cover letter for each of the applications that I include in my packet, in my file? And my answer is no. I personally believe that the simpler your file is, the better. When thinking about applications for different relatives that you are including in one envelope, so for instance, if you're filing one application for your mom and one application for your dad, but you're mailing them together. So in that case, I do think you should do two separate cover letters just because these are going to be completely different immigration cases. Now we're going to go over the cover letter sample that I have created, that I have adjusted over time for this video. So at any point, you're welcome to pause and retype my cover letter, use it as a sample. Um, I absolutely don't mind. We did get complimented during our green card interview about how well our file was organized and also the cover letter, how well it was written and um, that it helped our file look a lot more professional. Uh, the interviewer even asked if we used a preparing service and I said, no, <laughs> we did it all on our own. First and foremost, on the top right, corner, you can include your own address, your return address that you put in your applications, etc. So this is just an additional way to proofread yourself and also to have an additional piece of information for USCIS just to confirm that this is, yes, indeed the cover letter for you, that this is your application, that this is your address, just for them to have it on hand. And and then a little bit lower on the left hand side, kind of in the left hand corner, you will use this part to address it to USCIS. Typically, when you write a cover letter in any situation, you should be addressing it to a person or an organization. And in our case, it is the USCIS that you're sending your documents to. So you will address it to USCIS. And then uh, the next line says attention. So here, you can write a couple of things. This is what I at least saw on the internet when I was researching. 
So one thing you can write is I-130 and I-485, for example, or you can write something like AOS, adjustment of status. Either or is fine, but this is basically telling them the purpose of this cover letter is for you to apply at the end of the day for a green card. Next line, you will be putting in the lockbox facility address where you are mailing your entire packet. So this address that you're listing here should be exactly the same as the address you are writing on your actual envelope when you send in your application. To find your exact lockbox facility that you should be sending your applications to, you can go to USAS.gov um, or you can just Google, for example, I-130 direct filing addresses or I-485 direct filing addresses. So in the past year, the lockbox facilities did change and did move around for some applications, including I-485 um, and I-130 concurrent filing. So please go to the USCIS.gov site and look up the direct filing addresses for your application. Most likely you're watching this video because you are just like me sending in the forms I-130 and I-485 together or you submitted your form I-130 online and now you're following it up with your green card application. In this case, you should be looking on the USCIS site under the category of I-485 direct filing addresses and usually it is the first option on the list on that, on that web page that will say if you are sending your I-485 concurrently with I-130 or with an approved I-130, this is where you should send it depending on the state that you live in. And then moving on, this is the main portion of our cover letter. And this is where you would want to indicate what this cover letter is regarding specifically. So this is what RE means. RE means regarding. So you're obviously going to name the cover letter as the cover letter so that it's clear and then you're going to include what applications are in this package in this file so the main applications that usually people typically submit in their file is the petition for alien relative i-130 followed by the application for adjustment of status i-485 and then optional employment authorization and advanced parole applications and so these two um, are again very frequently people will submit them however these two applications are optional if you're not planning to work while you wait for your green card or if you're not planning to travel while you wait for your green card you don't have to submit them and also i do have a video i'm going to put on the top right corner of this video now that shows um, the exact documents and forms you should be submitting for your family-based immigration packet. Okay, so moving on, after we established what the purpose of this cover letter is, we're going to also outline who is the petitioner and who is the beneficiary in this case. And moving on, here we have a little blurb addressing the USCIS officer or the adjudicator officer that will be reviewing your case talking about who you are as a sponsor as a petitioner and why you are submitting these applications so you are more than welcome to use this um, as a sample for yourself again this doesn't have to be the same exact wording as mine if there's any additional things that you would like to include such as maybe if you want them to pay a particular attention to a part of your file maybe you can also include that in this blurb however this is just a standard thing that you can write next moving on so this is a little bit different from my previous video this is where i decided to include the most important part that will determine whether or not your application will be accepted or not and that is the file fee. So if you don't include the payment for these applications with your file, um, they will automatically be rejected and returned back to you. So please don't forget to include the uh, filing fee in whatever format you prefer it to be. I 
put those two in the very beginning just so they can see that I did submit the payment options. Again, the payment options I did explain in my um, putting together your immigration file video that they should always be going at the very top so that they can process them right away. And so for the filing fees, you can use a personal check, a money order, uh, or form G1450, which authorizes you to use a credit card. So I do have a video talking about different payment options and describing the advantages and disadvantages of each. Definitely check out that video. So moving on, after the payment options, I begin outlining the applications and the supporting documents that I included for each. So as you can see, I started with the I-130 petition for alien relative. Again, if you have already submitted your I-130 online and you're just following this up with your green card application, you don't have to include any parts of the I-130 here because you have already Already done that online. You do not need to reprint your I-130 application again. You do not to submit all the supporting documents again because you have already done that. However, if you're mailing everything in together, this is what you can write. So here um, I go over and I talk about how I submitted the form I-130 and then form I-130A. And again, I wrote here that this form is only needed for spousal petitions because the form I-130A is called supplemental information about spouse beneficiary. So if you're not filing for your spouse, say you're filing for your parents or your children, you don't need form I-130A. Moving on, I included the two passport style photos of the beneficiary and the petitioner. Again, that is for spousal petitions only. You do not need to include passport style photos if you are filing for anybody other than your spouse. Next, um, this is all followed from the supporting documents list in the form instructions. And again, don't just rely on this video to collect all the supporting documents. Definitely go and read each of the form's instructions to double check that you have included all the supporting evidence. So first of all, you want to include the proof of the petitioner's status, either as a US citizen or a permanent resident. So here you would want to include either the petitioner's US birth certificate uh, or like a naturalization certificate, or if the person obtained citizenship through parents, um, you can also use that, um, or a copy of your green card if you are a permanent resident, and you should be including the front and back of these documents, um, if they do have a backside, just in case. And next, you're going to move on to proof of spousal relationship, or as I wrote, proof of family relationship if filing for other relatives. So for spousal relationships, as you can see, this is going to be the biggest part of your I-130 application because you're going to have to prove your bona fide marriage. So this is where you might want to include, obviously, the copy of your marriage certificate. Um, if you live together, joint lease or proof of living together, like common bills. If you are covering each other by health insurance, you can include that. Any photographs of you together, social media posts, any third party affidavits. Um, again, I have a video on all of this. Um, and then I also wrote in italics, children's birth certificates, joint liabilities, joint bank statements, anything like that, anything that can prove your bona fide marriage. So this is where you would include it. If you are filing this application for somebody like your parent, for example, this is going to be super easy and super short. All you will need to include is a copy of your birth certificate, proving that your parents' names are listed on your birth certificate, in addition to uh, perhaps a copy of your parents' marriage certificates, et cetera, et cetera. Same applies to children and stepchildren. And again, all of those proofs of relationship are outlined 
in detail in the I-130 form instructions. So please make sure that you read those. So moving on, here is where you may want to include a, some kind of a list of additional documents that you think will help your case, such as I wrote, for example, copies of diverse uh, copies of divorce certificates or death certificates. If any of you have ever been married previously or if you have proof of any legal name change, then this is where you can also include these documents. Anything else that you feel like will help your case. The next section is devoted to I-45 application to adjust status. So here again, uh, completed and signed form I-45 two passport style photos. Here you will be including things like, for example, a copy of your passport as the beneficiary, a copy of your birth certificate with translations, a copy of your I-94 arrival departure record, or like a copy of your visa page. Uh, and um, when I was an F1 student, this is where I included a copy of my I-20 to prove my status in the US as an F1 student. So basically here you will be including evidence that also proves your uh, status in the United States, your current status status as well as your arrival status. Next, we're going to move on to another very important part of the application and that is the affidavit of support. So when you apply for adjustment of status, affidavit of support is a very considerable part of this application. So here, as you can see on the screen, you will see exactly what is required for the affidavit of support. And that is the form I-864, the petitioners slash main sponsors, most recent federal tax returns and W-2s or 1099s. Uh, other things that you may want to include is copy of the petitioner's pay stubs, uh, any kind of letters from employers that state current pay rate and annual salary. Uh, and also, this is very important, the proof of petitioner's status in the United States. So either a U.S. passport, birth certificate, green card, et cetera, et cetera. So these things are required from the petitioner or also known as the main sponsor. The petitioner will almost always be the primary sponsor. And even if you as the petitioner do not make enough income, you still should be including and filling out form I-864 and attaching all of this evidence proving that you make or either make or don't make enough income. So some additional things is if you are including assets, then you will obviously need to include proof of your assets and um, such as checking savings accounts. If you're, for example, including proof of your, like a value of your vehicle, a value of your house, this is where you will include appraisal documents, whatever it may be. Next, moving on. So all of this is in red because this is also kind of like an optional thing depending on your situation. So again, if you as the petitioner, as the primary sponsor are not making enough income. So in this case, you as the petitioner will need to include information from your household members, such as if you have a relative who lives with you in the same residence, who will be contributing their income to yours to help you meet the income requirement. This is where you will include that. And again, if this is something that applies to your situation, then you can obviously pause this video and see what is required. And then same thing applies to the joint sponsors. If by any chance you as a petitioner are not making enough income and you are going to request help from a joint sponsor, this is where you will also outline what documents you are including from your joint sponsors. So again, feel free to pause and um, look at this. And just to remind you guys that I have an entire playlist dedicated to the affidavit of support because it is one of the most complicated forms. So please check out that playlist. If you have any questions, on, I guarantee you will find an answer in those videos. And finally, moving on, the two additional and like I said, optional applications that you can submit is the application for employment 
patent authoriz authorization, which is known as I-765, and the application for advanced parole, also known as travel document, form I-131. So for these, um, all you will really need to submit is completed and signed forms, obviously, as well as passport style photos, as well as any additional documents that you think may be useful, such as, again, your entry information, one more time, um, proof of your like I-94, copy of your passport if you need to include it, copies of previous EADs, so previous employment authorizations that you have ever had. You could also include copies of those just to show that you have received one in the past. So anything like that can go here. And finally, the very last part of this cover letter is to thank the adjudicating officer for reviewing your application. Any additional things that you may want to include, any statements, anything like that. You can also include your contact information here as well, such as your phone number and your email. And again, you will already be including your contact information in the applications themselves. However, this is just another uh, way to cross-reference that contact information um, in case they ever need to quickly look at it and reach out to you. So this is where you can include that. Um, I would say that for the most part, USCIS is not going to give you a personal phone call or a personal email saying that there's something wrong with your file. However, this is just a good standard practice to include this little statement here. And finally, you would want to sign off and write your names. So this is the cover letter, as you can see, Mine is three pages long. So um, this is the example that I um, have for you guys. Obviously, like I said, feel free to use it. Uh, you're welcome to use it exactly as it is. And um, I do wish you luck with your immigration process Again, if you're new to this channel, please check out the videos that I have. I am sure you will find them very useful. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I really hope to see you in my next videos. Bye!